Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you out this afternoon for the first meeting of our just about the 89th year of the Scripps Fine Arts Foundation. We're glad you're here. I'm Sally Monastery, and I'm the a first year president. So, pardon any blunders I make. We've had a, quite an exciting summer, um, at least for the board, while plan we were planning our programs for the year. We were able, thanks to your generosity at our scholarship luncheon and some of you giving at uh, a higher level for your membership, we were able to award $4,500 in grants this summer. Uh, $1,000 went to the Art Start uh, program at the Claremont Lewis Museum of Art, and uh, the rest of it went to Scripps College for the Scripps Fine Arts Foundation Memorial Fund, the Miller Cheats Fund, the Albert Stewart Fund, the Art Conservation Special Projects Fund, and one thing we do during the year is award um, a stipend to senior art majors at Scripps, and I'm happy to say that a senior art major that received one of the stipends, thanks to your generosity, when she was a senior at Scripps, is here as our presenter today. And probably the the, the greatest adventure was the Claremont Heritage Gala. Oh, the Claremont Heritage Gala Museum, where Scripps Arts Foundation, or Scripps Fine Arts Foundation, received the Cultural Heritage Award. And if you want to take a closer look, it's on the table with the, all the certificates that um, everybody gets you on an occasion like that. So welcome. We have an exciting program this year. One change in the program which um, if you're on our mailing list, you will receive the card about the meeting, is our October meeting will be held at the Williamson Gallery on the Scripps College campus. And we will have a gallery tour of um, Getting It Done, which is a, a collection from, the, from Samela Lewis. Her, probably has some of her works in it, but things that were in your own personal art collection. So watch for that. And now I would like to introduce Catherine McIntosh, who does our fabulous graphics on our <coughs> brochure and cards that we get in the mail, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, um, so it's my pleasure to introduce fiber artist Robin Ostinger, who is the class of, first class of 2017. She's a fourth generation Script College graduate. Her mother, Leslie Optinger, who's here in the audience, um, lives in Thousand Oaks, and she's also with us here today. Um, so here in Claremont, many of you were friends with her grandmother, Martha Underwood. And I bet a few of you may have one of her lovely watercolors in your home. What you may not know is she also did fiber art. This is a piece that belonged to my parents from the 70s that I just gifted to Robin. In the early days, Mark Underwood worked for Mellichit Studio, producing the mosaic murals, gracing Garrison Theater and many others, and painted a lot of the murals in numerous bank buildings. So, and her mother, and Robin's mother, is, a, is also an artist. So we will hear how the art practices of women in Robin's family have influenced her own relationship with art. As an emerging contemporary fiber artist based in Ventura County, Robin is inspired by self-reflection, dream images, and the tactile nature of her medium. <clears throat> For the BA in mixed media visual arts, she has shown her work in various group shows throughout the Western states, and her work was published recently in the Fiber Art Now Spring 2022 issue. So we're very pleased to have Robin here and uh, let her take away and might get a uh, battery for the mic. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, as you know, my name is Robin Ossinjuk. I am an emerging fiber artist. Thank you so much to 
Catherine McIntosh for inviting me here today and the Fine Arts Foundation for having me. I'm going to be talking about how my family's influence on my fiber practice changed how I looked at art in my life, as well as talking about my process and a few series I'm currently working on. I graduated from Scripps College in 2017 with a bachelor's in visual arts with a focus in mixed media. I'm really excited to be back in Claremont. It's been too long. Since graduating, I've had my work in several group shows, notably Livewire at Form and Concept in Santa Fe, New Mexico in 2020. The Next Big Thing at Studio Channel Islands in Camarillo, California in 2022. Two solo shows, most recently as the featured February artist of the online gallery, America's Finest Underground Gallery in 2022. And I've also had my work published in the spring 2022 issue, Excellence in Fibers of the magazine Fiber Art Now. I come from a family of artists. I am the granddaughter of Claremont artist Martha Underwood and the daughter of portrait artist Leslie Ossinjek, both of whom also studied at Scripps. And having strong artistic women in my family has undoubtedly shaped my relationship with my creativity and showed me that art is a valuable pursuit as a career path, but also as a way to build community and strengthen relationships. Growing up, I witnessed many different ways of using creativity to be successful. As much as I loved my experience at Scripps, there was really only one narrative to success in the arts that was pushed by the art program. And that was to make conceptual work and to make a living off of your art by showing it in exhibitions. And for a long time, I thought this was the only way to be successful in the art world. But I had this great conversation with another local Ventura artist a year or so back. And we were talking about where we were in our practices and our art careers. And she said something that stuck with me. Every artist has their own definition of success. That got me reevaluating how I viewed success as an artist. Was it being profitable? Was it gaining exposure? Was it making work that was true to myself? Was it using art to bring a community together? And the artists in my family both my mother and grandmother, have been successful with their work in different ways, and their relationships with their art practices have had a profound impact on the relationship I have with my own practice. My grandmother, Martha Underwood, who I'm sure some of you knew and remember, was a successful career artist and a teacher. She's well known for her watercolor paintings in her later life, um, but she was also an accomplished uh, tapestry and fiber artist during the 60s and 70s, as well as involved in many mosaics adorning the walls of Los Angeles buildings and banks. She was featured in countless magazines and articles for her work. And she was a professor at Chafee College for 27 years, teaching everything from illustration to watercolors to stitchery to graphic design I remember going to grandma's house when I was very young, probably around four or five years old. And my favorite thing to do was experiment with her art supplies. She would set me up on the floor of her studio with a big pad of paper, markers, pens, paint, anything else I wanted. And I would sit on the floor of her studio and play with these materials, scribbling and smearing colors around while she worked on a watercolor. Before I could really draw anything recognizable, I was already loving the fact that I could use my hands to make something. And whatever I made was mine. My choices of materials, my choices of color. And from an early age, I was benefiting from her influence. And her excitement about art was so palpable that I was excited about art as well. She started battling cancer when I was in high school. 
She would come stay with us for days at a time so we could take care of her. By this time in my life, I had started taking my art a little more seriously. I was trying new mediums like oil paint and scratch board. I was pushing myself to pursue detail, create a likeness to my references. And I was even starting to move from copying pictures to creating work that um, had meaning to me. It was the first time in my life that I was brimming with excitement about the work that I was making. And I had my grandmother close by to share in that excitement. I remember she always had a sketchbook with her. I would come home from school, show her what I had been working on, and she would show me what she sketched that day. She would critique my work and give me tips on how to use materials or how to look closely at the light in a reflective object. I got to benefit from her years of teaching experience in these moments. I should have asked her more questions. I should have talked to her more about her own experiences. I was young, and even though I knew she was sick, I thought we would have more time. She didn't live long enough to see me get into scripts or start working in fiber. We never got to have those conversations or connect over a shared medium. And I think I uh, learned more about her life after she was gone than I ever did when she was alive. She graduated Scripps College and the Otis Art Institute working with Miller Sheets as an assistant in mosaics. She was involved in the design and fabrication of mosaics across the Los Angeles area, like our own Garrison Theater. And uh, she tried every medium she could get her hands on. Mosaic, stained glass, watercolor, fiber, uh, jewelry making, batik, oil paint, the list goes on. Going through her old work, I've seen silly cartoons, um, book illustrations, and playful watercolors. Her work has such a splendid sense of whimsy and fun. These are a few watercolors of hers if you hadn't already guessed. <laughs> Through stories my mom told me, I learned that Martha's art was one of the most important things to her in life. I don't think that there was ever a time where she wasn't thinking about her next endeavor or project. I admire her greatly for living and breathing her creativity. She had an incredible drive that pushed her to accomplish so many things. I admire her for pursuing art in her career and the success that she had not only in using her artistic talents to make a living, but using her knowledge and experience to teach others. Because of Martha's success, art has always been a path that is supported and encouraged by my family. I never heard the all too common comments that going after an art career is a waste of time or worthless ambition. Pursuing art as a career has always been an option for me because she proved it was possible. Of course, with a mother like Martha, it is no wonder my mother, Leslie Austin Jeck, is an established artist in her own right. Also a Scripps alum with a bachelor's in visual arts, my mother took her talent for impeccable detail and love for jewelry. And she graduated from the Gemological Institute as a diamond expert in the 85. She designed jewelry for celebrities in Los Angeles before starting a family and turning her creative acts of love, or creative, creative acts into love for her family, I guess. <laughs> now she works mainly in color pencil and pastel, producing heirloom quality still lifes and portraits that employ an expert use of color. Her practice consists mostly of working on commissions and showing her art locally. She is a member of the Westlake Artist Guild and she has her work in private collections across Southern California. While I was growing up, Leslie put her creative energy into acts of love and service for her family. From sewing my brother and me amazing Halloween costumes to saving memories through detailed scrapbooking 
She used her creativity to bring fun into the family and bring us together by managing elaborate pumpkin carving contests and encouraging silly Christmas cookie decorating. And her desire to bring creativity into all aspects of her life taught me that art is a way of living. And using your creativity is a valid and powerful way to show love and foster community and connection. As I grew up, started taking my art more seriously, I learned that my mom had been wanting to return to working in more traditional mediums like paint and pencil, but had abstained for years due to a guilty conscience. And this was a very eye-opening and life-changing conversation for me. Leslie had grown up with a very motivated artist as a mother. She gave me the impression that Martha's priorities sometimes had little room for things other than her practice. And here's a newspaper clipping I found of Leslie holding yarn for Martha. She works like on what looks like a macrame. Um, but when Leslie had children of her own, she wanted to make sure we felt loved and prioritized. She left her job as a jewelry designer and stopped creating for herself so that she could put her time and energy into raising a family. She put all of her creative efforts into doing and making fun things for her kids and for her family. And because of the complicated relationship between Leslie and her mother's art practice as she was growing up, Leslie felt as if a commitment to her own work would isolate her from her children. She felt this external and internal pressure to give her whole self to her family. And the push and pull of family responsibility versus creating for self-fulfillment resulted in a choice to set aside her art. And instead she channeled that energy into creative projects that her children could benefit from. And at the time that I learned this, my brother and I were grown enough that Leslie was not serving anyone by neglecting to follow her creativity in the way that she truly wanted. We began painting together regularly. Now she's moved on to colored pencil and pastel and even luxury hand crocheted beaded necklaces, a few of which I'm wearing today. With her kids out of the house, she has been able to transition her creative energy to serve herself. These are two of my favorite portraits of hers. Her use of color brings so much life to her portraits and words really can't describe how happy I am to see her produce such beautiful work. And from Leslie's efforts to bring art and creativity into my life at a young age to us sitting, to, to, sitting down together to paint when I was older, creativity has always been our glue. Our relationship is strong because we have a shared passion, but also because that passion gives us quality time together and opportunities to show each other that we care. Creativity is our love language, and we still use it to bring our family together. So, on one hand, I have a role model in Martha who pursued her artist career and made her, top, her practice a top priority. And on the other, I have a wonderful role model in Leslie who put her creative energy into acts of love for her family and friends. Martha created for herself and Leslie created for others. Both are admirable, but both make me a little bit sad. And I think there is a balance here. And it's something that I'm trying to achieve daily. Everyone struggles with balancing friends, family, work, health, sleep, etc. And I also struggle to balance my practice. Listening and learning about how Martha and Leslie's art practices affected their lives and the people around them instilled in me a desire for balance. I don't want to neglect or sacrifice a part of myself. And this means that some days my art practice takes a back seat and some days it's at the forefront of my priorities. My art practice is incredibly important to me and it is crucial for me living a happy life.
but it is one of many things that I need in order to be the best, best version of me. I am lucky enough to have these two women walk before me and have successes and make mistakes. Martha taught me that a career in the arts is a viable way to be successful and that following my desire to create is important for a fulfilling life. And Leslie taught me that art can be part of everyday life and creativity is a powerful way to build relationships and community. It is incredibly valuable to see that your goals are possible because someone else has walked the path before you. I have role models in the art world, like ceramicist Ronit Baranga, who shares my love for hands, portrait quilter Bisa Butler, who uses fiber to retell history and explore community, and the renowned Louise Bourgeois, who used her art practice in a therapeutic way. But I am most influenced by the women in my family who came before me. They have given me the space, the encouragement, and the tools to become the artist I am. They have given me the knowledge to walk my own path. So, what does my own practice look like? I work full time in graphic design. I'm lucky enough to be able to rely on my artistic abilities to make a living. I currently design food and spice labels and you can find my work in Costco and other stores across the country <laughs> and the rest of the world. But between my job, my social life, my relationships and my time outdoors, I also manage to prioritize my art practice. And this can take the form of working on a small piece on the couch while listening to an audiobook after a long day, or sketching out ideas on a scrap piece of paper while I'm at work, or holing up in my garage, which doubles as a studio space, and working on larger pieces for hours on the weekend. As an extension of my practice, I'm also the organizer of Art in the Alley, which is a small pop-up art walk that occurs every two to three months in Moore Park, California. Art in the Alley satisfies the need to include community and acts of service into my practice that was instilled in me by my mother. Organizing and participating in Art in the Alley has allowed me to foster relationships with other local creatives. I wanted to provide a space for artists to show their work that's free, intimate, and welcoming. And it really has become a beautiful community of artists who support one another professionally and emotionally. In my own practice, art is a tool to process emotions, life changes, and identity. Not only do the subjects and concepts of my work reflect this, but the mediums I gravitate to do as well. And I find that tactile mediums like fiber provide the most personal satisfaction. Fiber art requires repetitive motions like stitching and knotting that allow for a vulnerable and reflective mindset. And fiber is my main medium of choice and I've been working primarily in fiber for the last five years. Fiber is a medium that has historically been dismissed as a craft rather than an art because of its functionality and its traditional association with women. There was a fiber boom in the fine art world in the 1960s and 70s as feminist artists uh, turned to fiber as an opposition to these biases. And there have been many feminist artists over the years that have brought fiber into the fine art world like uh, Faith Ringgold and Judy Chicago. Fiber has a power to ride the line between art and craft. It is a detailed and labor intensive medium that has a home both in the domestic sphere as well as the fine art sphere. And Martha was working in fiber around the same time as this fiber boom. This is one of her pieces that she designed and had fabricated in France. 
Fiber makes me think of feminine energy, like dedication, warmth, and nurturement. It makes me think of art as an act of love and service, which are the roles that art played in my life as I was growing up. And while all of this adds another layer of meaning to my practice, I work in fiber because I absolutely love it. It is an incredibly satisfying medium that allows for experimentation with texture and form. And as fiber bridges that gap between craft and art, I feel as if I'm creating work that calls to be touched and experienced rather than merely looked at. And the tactile nature, repetitive motion and tedious timeline brings an intimacy between me and my work. The practice offers me a meditative headspace that helps me process my feelings and my life as I ruminate over the meanings behind my work. And my love for fiber began in my last year at Scripps while I was creating my thesis project. This was my first time working seriously in fiber. At the time, I was working mostly in mixed media and paint. And for my thesis, though, I wanted to be very true to myself and push the boundaries of my practice. I had this idea of an overwhelming mass of hands, overlapping and grasping and abstracted. I've dealt with anxiety my whole life and this mass of hands that I was imagining was a perfect representation to the anxiety that I was so familiar with. This is an early sketch for my thesis project. <clears throat> I knew I wanted to work on fabric to get a textural, almost fragile feel. I experimented with painting, but my vision began to change as I played around with incorporating embroidery. I became fixated on the way that my hands <coughs> were working to painstakingly embroider the hands on my fabric. I ended up committing to stitching the whole piece and I taught myself punch needle in order to spit, uh, speed up the process. I worked for months on this piece and as I worked I found that the motion of the punch needle and the repetitive nature of the work was soothing. I found that the creation of the piece itself offered a calm mentality that helped me process my feelings and soothe that anxiety. And this piece is what started my love affair with punch needle and it's led to other fiber techniques such as embroidery and machine tufting. So I mainly use two techniques when creating my work, um, hand tufting and machine tufting. Unlike weaving, which creates a rug from interweaving threads of yarn together, um, tufting is a technique where you start with a canvas or a loosely woven backing and you pull strands of yarn through the backing with a hand tool or a machine. I found this diagram online, hopefully it helps to kind of visualize the process. Um, the hand tufting gun shown here isn't a tool that I use, but the, the idea is the same. Tufting has origins in early rug making, dating back to 15th century Persia and before. In the 1920s, industrial tufting machines were invented to keep up with the demand of those soft tufted rugs. And it wasn't until the 1950s that tufting became a popular recreational activity in the United States through punch needle and rug hooking. And there actually has been a resurgence of recreational tufting recently. During the pandemic, many creative people picked up tufting as a new medium or as a hobby um, while they were stuck in their homes. And with the affordable handheld uh, tufting machines that are now available, Tufting is more accessible as a medium than it ever has been before. So I started my fiber journey using a punch needle 
which is the tool you can see on the left there. And the punch needle is a hollow needle. It's attached to a handle. And the yarn is threaded through the needle and the needle is punched through the base of the fabric to create loops or tufts on the front. You can use different needle lengths to get different lengths of loops and create dimension and texture. And you can also punch through the front of the fabric and create uh, flat stitches that allow for greater precision and detail, which you can see me doing in this photo. Punch needle is a slow and tedious process. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it because the process gives me space to breathe, relax, and reflect. The repetitive motions and tactile nature of the technique are very satisfying to me and let, let me feel like I'm deeply connected to my work. I actually have a video here. Let's see if this works. I think I have two. Yes. And this video is sped up, but you'll get the idea. I began using a tufting machine in 2021 as a way to create larger work faster. You can see my tufting machine on the right. And the tufting machines work similarly to the punch needle. You still thread your yarn through a hollow needle, but instead of pushing the needle in and out of the fabric by hand, you press the trigger and direct the machine across the stretch fabric and it does it all for you. So I have another video for you. I now have two types of tufting guns. One is a loop pile, which kind of mimics the look of a punch needle, which you can see in the image above. And the other is cut pile, which um, the machine actually cuts the loops as it goes to create this soft, fuzzy shag look, which you can uh, see in the image below there. I can adjust the height of my needles and the tufting machines to create depth, but I also utilize an electric trimmer to carve my yarn into sculptural forms. <clears throat> so I'm gonna be touching on three different series of mine. The first is my hand series. And I've had so many people come up to me at shows and ask, why all the hands? Why do, why do you keep coming back to hands? And my obsession with hands started at Scripps when I was deciding what I wanted to make for my thesis. I had other strong ideas that I was excited about at the time, but something kept pulling me back to this vision of clusters of overlapping hands. At the time, I wasn't quite sure why I felt such a strong need to bring um, the hand motif into my work time and time again. <clears throat> um, but I've had lots of years, many years, to think about and reflect why I have such a strong urge to keep bringing them back. Hands are one of the most expressive parts of the body. We communicate with them, experience the world through them with touch, and they can represent both the individual and the masses. Hands are a symbol of agency, of community and creativity, of power, tenderness and humanity. They are the perfect vessel to explore nuanced emotions. And over the past several years, I've used hands in my work to explore feelings of love, uh, growth, frustration, hope, and community. The next series is I like to call the in-between. 
And this series contains some very different pieces, um, but they all share one common thing. They are all based off of things that I saw behind closed eyes in the dreamlike state I like to call the in-between. And this is a specific state of consciousness that kind of floats between wakefulness and full sleep, where my subconscious is active, but I'm still lucid enough to recognize and remember images, colors, shapes, and forms. And the images and colors I see in the in-between vary greatly. Sometimes they're recognizable, like a bubblegum pink tree. And sometimes they are abstract, like a glowing aura. And these pieces don't stem from active intent, but rather their meanings begin to take shape as I work on them. I often don't understand why a specific image sticks with me, but as I go through the process of bringing it into life, sketching out the concept and spending hours on tufting and stitching, I get to sit with the image. In the time that it takes me to create peace, it begins to mean something to me. And this is another way that my work helps me process and get to know myself better. The nature of fiber art gives me time to ponder and reflect on the personal significance of these dreamlike images. And the last series I'm going to be talking about uh, is called The Earth is Breathing and So Are You. This is a series I started during the pandemic. <clears throat> I moved out of my parents' house on the day of the first California shutdown. <laughs> yeah, I started my independent life at a time when we had to stay home and be isolated from our friends and family. One of the things that kept me sane is that the apartment that I moved to was only a two minute walk from the sand in Oxnard, California. I took long walks on the near empty beach every day, no matter the weather. And although I was lonely and anxious like so many of us were, the sound of the ocean breathing in and out was like a soothing balm. I started noticing patterns on the sand that were naturally occurring either formed by the wind or by the water. I began sketching these patterns, um, which turned into this ongoing fiber series that really is an ode to my home. Working on this series makes me think about the relationship between civilization and nature. We all heard about the reports of nature recovering while we were quarantining during the pandemic. Air quality improved in some areas, noise pollution was reduced, and even some human disturbed habitats began to recover. The studies also show that mental health declined. And this is due to many reasons, but I think part of it is because Many people were suddenly told to stay inside. Popular hiking trails and beaches were closed. Access to the outdoors was limited to many people. And it makes me think that we need nature so much more than it needs us. Easy access to outdoor space was and is so essential to my well being and I will forever be grateful for that access. So this series is representative of my need for nature on a very personal level. Moving forward with my practice, I am continuing to play with my medium and learn new techniques. I've begun to focus on the relationship of color 
and sculptural form over the last year or so, but I, I want to push that further as I create new work. So I'm, I'm looking forward to experimenting more, working on some new ideas. I'm currently creating a body of work for a show that I have coming up in January in Ventura. I'll be showing my work alongside another local painter, uh, Nancy Horwick, and I'm really excited to see our work complement the other. But that is about it for me. Thank you so much to all for listening. And to Sure, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to take them. Do you work on your series simultaneously, or do you exhaust one before you move on to the other? And if so, how do you know when you're done? That is a great question. I work on them simultaneously. Um, and I'm actually often working on two or three pieces at a time. So. Um, in the garage on my large frame, maybe I'll be working on a couple pieces for The Earth is Breathing, and so are you. And upstairs, I'll have a smaller frame, um, and I'll be working on a hand series, yeah. But knowing when a series is done is very tricky. And I think, you know, it's going to be done when I get bored with it, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. Yes. I have two questions. Sure. When you're using the tufted machine, mm -hmm. you look like you had it on a frame. Yeah. Is there anything behind it, or are you just pressing against the tension of the fabric to get the tufted machine to work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just the tension of the fabric, it's stretched on this frame, actually using carpet tacks. Okay. So it's removable. Um, but yeah, it's just the, the tension uh, is enough to keep it from falling off and uh, keep the, the machine, I guess, level with the fabric so that all of the loops are the same length. Then my next question was, what needle number and brand are you using when you do the punch needle? I use uh, the Oxford punch needle. Um, and it's more on the expensive side for punch needles, but it is worth it, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, and I think I use an eight and a 10. Yes. What kind of yarns do you use? Uh, I use mainly acrylic yarns, um, medium weight. Uh, and I use them because they fade. They don't, I mean, they don't fade as much as um, natural fibers yet. Yes. Do you create your own colors by dyeing? I wish I did. <laughs> Um, that is one of the next steps for me. I would love to get into dyeing and spinning my own yarn, um, but I just haven't gotten there yet. Something on the back to hold all the stitches in place? Yes, for the, um, the ones that I use, or for the pieces that I make with the tufting machines, I actually uh, glue the back with a latex carpet glue um, and then back it with felt or other fabric backing. And then for the ones that I make using the punch needle, I actually don't um, because the stitches are so compact that there isn't a lot of chance of it unraveling. Yeah. How do you deal with the urge that viewers may have to touch your works but in the art galleries and things? It is challenging. It's kind of just about trust, you know. Um, I usually will, on the art tags, I'll put, please do not touch. Um, but I really, you know, kind of rely on the gallery, um, you know, kind of enforcing that. And then when I uh, show at Art in the Alley, I'm there. And I also have smaller pieces that I um, invite people to handle and touch so they can kind of you know, feel what it's like without going for the big pieces, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again, Robin. Thank you. Thank you.